if for any epsilon you, you are able to to uh, find a delta, so that this is true. Remember, we have a graphical interpretation of this property, which uh, I won't draw again, but uh, uh, the idea is that we draw an interval on the y-axis around f of a, and we can find a small interval around a on the x-axis that by transformation f will go from the x-axis to the interval we had at the, uh, at the beginning on the y-axis. So that's, that's the, the interpretation of uh, this property. This should remind you of the, con the definition of convergence for sequences. It's very much the same type of thing. And like for uh, sequences, what you do is you give yourself an epsilon and you find something. The something for a convergence of sequence was a capital N. Here you need to find a delta. So Tracy came in this morning and complained that we had not computed any delta, which is right. I mean, we, we have not. But uh, we don't really need to. Uh, we, we will use only uh, this for inequalities. And I'm going to give you an example right now. Okay, uh, Deltas are not more difficult to compute than Ns, capital Ns. And we haven't computed that many of those either. I mean, the, the idea for these things is to have a precise proof use it for elementary functions, and then use operations on functions or sequences to get the result for general cases, more general cases, rather than doing the proof every time. OK, application. That will need several times, I think, in, in the future. So let's uh, define a function g. continuous at A such that G of A is strictly positive. And the question is, show that there is delta such that if x minus a is less than delta and x belongs to d, then uh, g of x is bigger than g of a over 2. This is a useful result because it tells you that if your function is continuous at uh, some point and it's strictly positive at that point, then there is a small interval around that point where you know that your function is bounded below by a strictly positive number. Okay, you, you cannot drop to zero over Sano because if, if, uh, if you could, then it wouldn't be a continuous function. Okay, so the idea is, because it's strictly positive, then we can we have some room around. And of course, we don't know how it will depend on the function, what, uh, how big delta is. Maybe it's extremely small. But still, it's a strictly positive number that ensures that around uh, a minus delta, a plus delta, we are above a certain level for the function. OK? So uh, proof of that, well, it's simply the definition of the second definition, uh, take epsilon, well, or let's do it, let's do it in general, take epsilon positive, and we know there is delta, so that x minus a is smaller than delta, implies uh, g of x minus g of a less than epsilon, which means that g of x is between g a minus epsilon and g a plus epsilon for all x minus a smaller than delta. 
Okay, so we do exactly what we do for the sequence. We we have our double inequality, but this time it's true for all x, so that x minus a is less than delta. Now, what should I take for my epsilon? Since I, I can pick an epsilon, any epsilon I want, which one should I take here? Yes, it's enough. We, we can just pick epsilon equal g of a over 2. That's uh, a legal epsilon because g of a is strictly positive. So we can do that. And then if we do this, this guy becomes g of a over 2. And we are done. So it's uh, this type of uh, application that will, for, for which this definition will be useful. Questions? What now? Well, so the, the way, the proper way to write this would have been to start saying my epsilon g of a, or g of a over two. Then there is a delta that's depending on this epsilon. Your delta always depends on your epsilon because you fix first your epsilon and then you find your delta. Okay. Exactly. So uh, that's basically it for 5.1. Let's start 5.2. So 5.2 is about limits and derivatives. Uh, we have talked about the limits of sequences, of course. Now we have to talk about limits of functions, and that's a little more subtle. Uh, not that different, but we need to be more careful. Uh, because Essentially, because we are taking now, instead of looking only at naturals, remember, when you're looking at the limit of a sequence an, you're letting n go to infinity, and n is a, is, a, is a natural. So, And that set of naturals is not very mysterious. I mean, uh, however, when you do uh, a limit for reals, then uh, you need to make sure that uh, the domain where your function is defined is not too pathological, okay? because there are some really nasty things that can happen on the rails, and you want to avoid that. So in order to do that, we start with the notion of limit point. So we first talk about limit point, and then we'll talk about limit of a function. And I know that there are many different notions now, you know, we are getting really into analysis, but you need to make an effort of uh, memorization, of understanding, of separating the different notions. Okay? It cannot be uh, something uh, very cloudy in your mind because it will show sooner or later. Okay? So there, there is a real effort here to be made. So what are limit points? Limit points. Uh, we say that A is a limit point of D, where D is uh, some subset of the reals, <coughs> if there is a sequence A n in D, such that An is different from A and An converges to A.
For instance, let's take d to be 0 and open on both sides. Is 1 a limit point? Of D. In other words, can I find a sequence in D which is never equal to 1? <coughs> of course, it's never equal to 1 because 1 is not in D anyway. And such that the sequence converges to 1. Can I do that? What should I take? 1 over n, one over n is not going to converge to 1. 1 minus 1 over n. <coughs> so 1 minus 1 over n belongs to D, at least when n is bigger than 2. And 1 minus 1 over n is never 1. And 1 minus 1 over n goes to 1. So the answer is yes. 1 is a limit point. What are the other limit points of D? Zero, 1 closed. OK, all the points in 0, 1 closed are limit points of this set. OK, so we can. Because you can do exactly the same thing for 0, and you would take 1 over n to show that uh, it converges to 0. And if you take any point strictly between 0 and 1, you can always do that too, because you, you are just going to take a sequence uh, converging to that point, which is inside D. Okay, it's maybe a little uh, trickier to write, but uh, intuitively it's clear that you, you are able to do that. So that's one example. Now, uh, another example would be to say, well, <coughs> what happens if I take for D to be the set 2, 3? So the set like this embraces means that I have two elements, 2 and 3. So what are the limit points of D in this case? No limit points. I cannot do, uh, uh, I cannot have limit points when I have a final set like that. Why not? Well, let's try to approach 2, for instance. Well, we need a sequence in D, so it's a sequence of 3s. A sequence of 3 is approaching 3, not 2. So clearly, 2 and 3 are not limit points. And if you take anything else in between, let's say, again, you, your choice is only between 2 and 3s. You're never going to approach something else. Okay? So the two only possible candidates would be 2 and 3, but 2 and 3 are eliminated. So the limit points of D are, are e, no limit points in D. Now, why is this uh, uh, an interesting uh, notion when you're looking for a limit of a function? It's because when you are looking for a limit of a function, you're looking for, you want to approach your, uh, the, 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 you want to approach A, but you want to make sure that you can approach it in a reasonable way. And so the, the fact that it's a limit point gives you that, that you know, you, you'll find a sequence in D that goes right there. So that's, that's why we need this, uh, this idea of limit point. OK, so let's now define the limit of a function. <coughs> 
So first thing we need to have A to be a limit point of D. Then F is said to have a limit at A if for all sequences A n converging to A and A n different from A for all n we have f of a n converging to L. So I should have said this. f is said to have a limit L here at a if for all sequences a n going to a, a n different from a, we have f of a n converging to L. Uh, so again, the, the definition really uses the, the idea of limit point because if, I, if A is not a limit point, then there is no such thing as a sequence A n uh, in D, I should have said. Otherwise, it doesn't. So, yeah. So, D is the domain of my function, as always. I need a sequence converging to A. Uh, and A n is different from A. If, you see, if A is not a limit point, you don't have such a sequence. So the definition is vacuous. I mean, you are asking for something that is always going to be true because you cannot test your uh, definition since you don't have such a sequence. So anything will have a limit, uh, which you want to avoid, of course. So we are going to do examples of limits. Uh, but first, maybe let's, let's uh, link continuity and limits. So F is defined <coughs> on D. A belongs to D. F is continuous at A if and only if um, F has the limit f of a at a. Yeah, I should have introduced some notation before doing that. So when you talk about the limit of f of x as x approaches a, you use this notation, of course. Okay, so instead of this, we could just write that f is continuous at a if and only if the limit of f of x as x approaches a is f of a. Yes? Here we have a uh, in d, but uh, the example we did on limit points, uh, we had uh, d was defined as strictly between 0 and 1. Mm -hmm. 0 and 1 were limit points. Yes. Hmm. So I guess my question is, can't you have an a that is not in d? Yes, all the time. We, we look for limits for, for uh, the interesting limits usually are uh, limit are points for which the function is not defined. So it's not, A is usually not in D. And this is a particular case when your A is in D, then your, uh, you, you, can, you can compare what it means to have a limit with continuity. But if your function is not defined at A, then it doesn't make sense because it cannot be continuous at A. Okay. See, so it's only when your A is in D that you can compare the two. 
Okay, so that's an important property because it gives you a criterion. It tells you uh, where you, in in both ways. I mean, because it gives you a way to compute limits. Just do f of a if you know that your f is continuous, and it also gives you a way to check whether your function is continuous by compute the limit and check whether it's f of a. So so both sides of uh, this equivalence are are interesting and useful. Now, I'm not going to prove that uh, uh, because one implication is tricky and the other one is kind of trivial. So, so we'll, we'll just uh, admit this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so for instance, let's apply this. Let's apply this to a polynomial, for instance. So let's see that P is a polynomial. <laughs> What's the limit of P of X as X approaches A? Well, according to what we have here, it's P of A. Because P is continuous at A, and therefore, the limit must be P of A. So, P is continuous at A. So, limit of P of X as X approaches A is P of A. Okay, there isn't, there isn't much to do. Okay, the, the classical example that you must have seen in calculus is the following. So we define this function for x different from 2, or minus 2. And we take f of minus 2 to be 1. So if we uh, do that, then the domain of f is uh, the whole line, because this is defined everywhere except for x equal minus 2. And we take care of x equal minus 2 by, by doing this here. Okay, so we define our function f in two pieces. And the question, the interesting point here, of course, is what happens at minus 2? Elsewhere, it's uh, quite easy, because if x is different from minus 2, I have a rational function. A rational function is a continuous function, and therefore the limit is going to be f of the point. Okay, so the only uh, point of interest is really minus two, where we are changing our uh, our definition our, the f of uh, the function f. So let's look at that. So the question is, what is the limit of f of x as x approaches minus 2? Well, what we do is we say, well, take xn converging to minus 2 and xn different from minus 2. OK, that's my first 
thing to do and I want to compute a limit, I take a sequence that goes to the point I'm interested in, which is minus 2, but cannot be equal to, to the point in question. Then I compute f of xn. Well, because I know that xn is never minus 2, I use this expression. Not this one. It's not minus 2, so it's xn squared minus 4 over xn plus 2. And you need to do some algebra, otherwise, uh, as you as you approach minus two, you are in trouble. You have a denominator here. You cannot use oper operations on limits at this point because you would have a zero here. That's not valid. So that's why you do a little algebra. You get this, and this is something you can do operations on limits. You go to minus two, minus two, which is minus four. So. The limit as x approaches minus 2 of this function is minus 4. Now, in order to compute this limit, I don't need to the value of f minus 2. I have not used that. OK, you can look at what I did. At no point, I need to know that f of minus 2 is 1. Actually, f could very well not be defined at minus 2, and I would do exactly the same thing. I don't need anything else to do this. What about continuity? So second question, is this function f continuous at minus 2? It's not, why not? Right. So, no, it's not. Otherwise, the limit of f of x as x approaches minus 2 would be f of minus 2, which is not the case here. Could I make this a continuous function? By doing what? Yes, define f of minus 2 as being minus 4 instead of being 1, and then you have a nice continuous function. OK? Questions on limits? You said that limit points were a way of avoiding you know, pathological domains. Are there examples of these domains? You don't want to know that. It's, uh, now, the thing is that you really can create, but it takes some work. You can create some domains that are uh, where you, know, you, you have only isolated points, for instance. And you, cannot, you have no way to really get close to the point in question. And so you want to avoid that because then how you don't really have a sequence converging to your A. And, uh, and therefore, the, the definition of limit is vacuous. That's what I understood you were saying. But I would, the examples are too involved. Well, you would, uh, uh, you would use, for instance, the counter set. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So you, what you do is you, you start with a 0-1 with a interval. You, you slice it in three. You get rid of uh, the middle third. And then, or you keep the middle third. <laughs> OK, maybe I should review my counter set before I, I talk to you about okay. it. Uh, yeah, yeah, what you do is you do an iteration like that, where you are making more and more holes. And in the end, you have something quite pathological, because you do have a lot of points in it. It's not even countable. But you have lots of holes, and there's not much you can do with. So that, 
when, when you start doing more analysis, you need domains like that that, are, that arise in practice, and you need to know what to do with those, but not at this point. So that's why uh, I won't talk too much about it, but uh, I'll be happy to, to give you some references if you'd like. So, uh, yeah, I, apparently I do a bold move here. I go directly to the derivative, which, okay, which is a kind of limit, so. of function f, if it exists, uh, so first thing, we, we are going to stick to f defined on an open interval i. Uh, and then Okay, so an open interval for us is uh, something like a, b, or minus infinity a, or b plus infinity. These are the three types of open intervals. Okay, so that's what we have in mind. Or the whole line. <coughs> that's also an open interval for us. Then we say that f is differentiable. at a, and a must belong to i, if the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h exists. <coughs> Okay, so you do the ratio f of f plus h minus f of a over h, and you compute the limit as h goes to zero. If it exists, then you have a differentiable function. And the notation is, uh, if it exists, then this thing, the limit is denoted by f prime of a. Okay, so this is typically a limit problem. Why? Uh, this ratio, as a function of age, okay, think that your a is fixed and it's your age which is varying. Well, this is not defined for h equals zero, clearly. And you are interested to precisely what happens as h approaches zero. Okay, so that's a typical limit problem and uh, a good application of limits. Now, before we start computing uh, limits, let's, let's uh, state a lemma, which is quite easy to prove, but uh, I think clarifies ideas a little bit. Yes, yeah, so... And it's actually something we just did on the example. But anyway, so if f and g are defined on d, 0 is a limit point of d, and f of x is equal to g of x for all x different from 0 and in d. Now, if the limit of g of x as x approaches 0 is L, then 
the limit of f of x as x approaches 0 must be L2. So if you think about this, this is precisely what we did in the example x square minus 4 over x plus 2, because we said x square minus 4 over x plus 2 is really x plus 2, or x minus 2. And the two functionals are the same except for one point, x equal minus 2. I know how to compute the limit of g of x, therefore the limit of f is the same thing. Okay, so that's something that we actually do all the time when we are computing limits. So it's good to have it in general so that it's out of the way and we can just use it. So the proof of that. Well, you take xn going to 0. You know that <coughs> and xn different from 0. So you know that f of xn is equal to g of xn for all n. Since g of xn converges to L, so does f of xn. See, the point is that because you are taking xn different from 0 for every n, the functions f and g are identical on xn. If one of them converges to L, the other one must converge as well, and we're done. Okay, so there, is, there isn't much really in this lemma, it's just to have it stated. <coughs> so, let's compute some derivatives. And let's start by constant functions. So, uh, if f is constant, then f is differentiable, and f prime is zero everywhere. So, proof, let's define g of h as being f of 0 plus h minus f of 0 over h, for h different from 0, <coughs> and um, z of h to be 0 for all h. Now, because f is a constant function, what can you say about g of h? It's 0, because this is the same as this. OK? So we get 0. Oh, I don't know why I picked 0 here. Uh, we could pick A, that would be better, so that we do it in general. Okay, A plus H minus A. So you, you pick an A and you do your function G like this. So what we have is that G of H is equal to Z of H for all H different from zero. I define it like this. Okay, I call the function z, the, the, the constant 0, I call it z. That's all. And therefore, I have that g of h is equal to z of h for every h. Now, what's the limit 
as h goes to 0 of z of h. It's 0. Why is it 0? How can I? I'm sorry? Yeah, or I say z is a continuous function. The limit is therefore equal to z of 0, which is 0. Okay, there are 100 ways to justify that. It's clear that this limit exists and is equal to 0. That's the important thing. Then, by the lemma, I have two functions that are equal everywhere except at 0, and I know that the limit of one is 0, therefore the limit of the other one is 0 as well. Okay, so by lemma, the limit of g of h is 0. So this proves two things. This proves that the constant function is differentiable everywhere and its derivative is identically zero. See that my derivative does not depend on a, I just find zero of course. That's the, here you see, I'm dealing with a constant function. So this is constant minus constant, that's zero. Okay, we're dealing with f equal constant. Well, not if f is a constant. f is 2, okay, everywhere. So you get 2 minus 2 over h. So you get 0, but it's not defined at h equals 0. That's why we do this uh, uh, thing here to have, to have it defined everywhere. And uh, we get uh, the limit by doing that. So that gives us the first result. Now let's do another one. Uh, assume that uh, g of x is x squared. <coughs> uh, and show that g prime of a is 2a for all a. OK, that's what we want to show. So same uh, as before, we do phi of h, which is this ratio, g of a plus h minus g of a over h. And we compute things. And the thing is to factor h. In these computations, that's what you're trying to do. So you use the difference of two squares uh, formula, and you get a plus h minus a times a plus h plus a over h. And then this is h, so you can cancel this and that. And you end up with 2a plus h. So we have that phi of h is 2a plus h for h different from 0. Now you do what? You, 
you do the limit when h goes to zero. And well, if you want to be completely precise, you define a new function that you call that is always two two a plus h, which has a limit. So let's do it. So define p of h as being two a plus h for all h. And then you have phi of h, which is p of h, for all h different from 0. Now the limit as h approaches 0 of p of h is p of 0, because p is a polynomial in h, and p of 0 is 2a. Because of a lemma, I can say that phi of h approaches 2a as well as h approaches 0. Questions? So the technique is kind of clear. What you do is you do some algebra to get rid of the H. When first thing, you must set up your ratio like this for your function. You do some algebra, you get rid of the H. And then you let your h go to zero. You usually have a function you know how to compute the limit of, and you compute your limit, and you're done. Okay, so that's that's how you compute this basic uh, these basic limits. So the more general result, of course, so for any n natural. We have that the function p of x equal x n is differentiable everywhere, and p prime of a is n times a n minus one. And you're going to redo exactly what we did for the case n equal two. Okay, you, you are going to have a plus h to the n minus a to the n instead of a plus h square minus a square, and then you use the difference between two and power. Okay, you remember the, the identity we, we used, so you get a plus h minus a, and then you get all the powers of these guys here. So it would start with a plus h to the n minus one plus uh, a, a plus h, n minus 2, and so on. You get rid of your h because this is h, and you're left with this guy. But this is a polynomial in h. And so you can plug x, h equal 0, and you get n terms that are all a to the power n minus 1. Okay, the details are written up. Page 170. Okay. Um, yeah, it's about time to talk uh, of uh, the geometric interpretation of this.
so you have a function f and you have your two points a and a plus h and what you're doing really when you're doing f of a plus h minus f of a over h you are computing the slope between these two points okay you are computing the slope of a straight line uh, that goes through these two points and the idea of differentiability is well I'm going to let h go to zero and in the limit I'm going to have really a tangent to the curve instead of having a secant. Okay, so it barely touches. Now what's interesting about differentiability is that really it's, an, it's a property which is not that common. I mean, uh, that's again something that is done uh, later on in analysis. You have ways to measure uh, how big is a set of functions. And what can show that there are many, many more continuous functions than differentiable functions. So that's one thing, one thing that we usually take for granted because if, you, if we draw a function at random, we always have the impression that it's a differentiable function. But really there are many more non-differentiable functions, actually functions that are uh, differentiable nowhere, okay, so, uh, than differentiable functions. And uh, one, one uh, fascinating uh, experiment is the so-called uh, Brownian motion, which was taken on by a, a, a botanist, Brown, and looked at pollen um, moving on the surface of water, and looked at, at the movement of uh, these grains of pollen. And it, it looked completely erratic. I mean, it really looks completely like at every moment you change direction, you can go uh, uh, the movements are independent uh, and so on and he ends up you end up when you do that so you can define mathematically a process that looks like that that models that and you end up with uh, paths for the pollen grain that are continuous because there are no jumps but that are nowhere continuous and nowhere differentiable so nowhere differentiable uh, it, you cannot draw it of course because this would not be differentiable at the corners but it's differentiable everywhere else. What you need to try to imagine is a path where you have only corners. Okay, so it's like a fractal where you seem to be okay here, but if you look a little closer, you see that actually you have some angle again here, and again and again and so on, until you have only this. So that was kind of a shock because uh, it's, it really arises from a process that's rather, uh, that looks quite regular. You're not really trying to construct a monster, but you end up with something which is rather unusual. So uh, that's, that's the idea of uh, the geometric uh, interpretation. Now, uh, what one, one uh, thing that uh, we haven't done yet is show that some things are not differentiable. So, Okay, so yeah, that's one, one important thing. So we have talked about how to show uh, differentiability. Now let's talk a little bit about non-differentiability. So this function is not differentiable at uh, zero because you cannot really find a tangent. I mean, you have a tangent on the right and a tangent on the left, but they do not coincide. Therefore, it's not a differentiable function. How do we prove that? Well, so the definition is I need to have the existence of a limit for this function. So I want to show that the limit does not exist. There are several ways 
uh, a limit that does not exist. One way, like here, is to find two sequences approaching zero that give me different limits for the function. And that will prove that the limit does not exist. So, so our objective here is to show that we want that the limit of g of 0 plus h minus g of 0 over h. We want this to show that this does not exist. So, the, the reason it doesn't exist is because if I approach from the right, I get something different from, from the left. Uh, therefore, I'm going to define xn first, which is 1 over n, which approaches 0, which is always different from 0. And I'm going to compute g of 0 plus xn minus g of 0 over xn. And what do I see? Well, I see absolute value of xn over xn, because g of 0 is 0. And absolute value of xn is xn, actually, because this, we are talking about 1 over n. And so this is 1. Okay. So what we have shown here is that g of 0 plus xn minus g of 0 over xn converges to 1. So for a particular sequence, we have found that along that sequence, our ratio converges to 1. Now we're going to show that for a yn, we get a different limit. If we get two different limits, we know the limit does not exist. So what should I pick for yn? Negative 1 over Yes, negative 1 over n, because uh, I'm trying to show that from the left and right, I see different things. So the natural choice is to do this. And then we do g of 0 plus yn minus g of 0 over yn. And therefore, this is going to be absolute value of yn over yn. Now, absolute value of yn <coughs> is minus yn. OK? And therefore, we get minus 1. So this time, g of 0 plus yn minus g of 0 over yn converges to minus 1. Uh, hence, g of 0 plus h minus g of 0 over h has no limit as h goes to 0. It has no limit because if it had one, I would have a fixed number l for which every time I approach 0, I get the same thing. I have been able to find two different sequences, both approaching 0, for which I get different limits. Therefore, there is no such fixed number. Yeah? So that's one way where you don't have a limit. Now, for first day, I'll let you dream about how to prove that square root of x is not differentiable at 0. And here, the argument must be different because it's a different reason. This time, your tangent is vertical. 
and therefore it's not differentiable. But it's not an argument of showing that from the left and right you see different things. So here, what, how would you prove that? What would you do? Correct. Pick a sequence, like 1 over n, approaching 0, and compute g of 0 plus 1 over n minus g of 0 over 1 over n. And if you're lucky, this will not be bounded. And that's enough. Then you have found one sequence for which your, your ratio doesn't converge, and you are done. Okay, so these are the two main methods to show that the function is not differentiable. So we'll see this next time. Let's stop here for today. Oh, homework for the following week. Homework for so October 19, and we are talking about 5.2. One, two, five, six, and seven. Yeah, uh, for the time being, that's it.